pleasure to be here and moderate this uh, session. I must thank Dr. Lochner and organizers for inviting me to do this uh, moderating. So welcome everyone for this uh, ninth um, webinar of IPERS. The title of this webinar is Medication Without Harm, the role, role of Healthcare Workforce. I'm sure this is going to be an interesting session as well as an informative session for all of you. So before I move on to introducing the speakers and the session, let me give you a little bit of uh, ground rules of this webinar. Uh, we don't encourage you to ask questions verbally or raise hand. Uh, this will disturb uh, presenters and the proceedings as well. Uh, so sorry about that. Uh, no uh, questions verbally or raise hand. Uh, instead, we would like you to uh, like you all to use the question and answer facility in the bottom of the screen, as well as the chat box to post your questions. So I can direct those questions to the relevant presenters. Uh, please mention the name of the presenter in the question so that I can um, send your question to the relevant presenters. So let me uh, uh, introduce uh, the three eminent speakers. So we have two international speakers and one uh, from University of Peradeniya, uh, Prof. Andrew McLachlan from Sydney Pharmacy School, the University of Sydney, Australia. Uh, Professor Patricia Davidson, Vice Chancellor, Wollongong University, Australia, and Dr. Fahim from Department of Pharmacy, University of Peradeniya. So we have uh, three sessions uh, for today's webinar. Session one is investigating drug herb interactions. Uh, session two, the healthcare workforce uh, integral to achieving uh, the WHO Global Patient Challenge and sustainable development. Session three, maximizing optimal use of medicines by implementing clinical pharmacy services, evidence from Sri Lanka. So let's move on to session one. So session one will be uh, presented by Professor Andrew McLachlan. Professor Andrew McLachlan is the head of school and dean of pharmacy in the Sydney Pharmacy School and a member of the Order of Australia. He is the former program director of the NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence in Medicines and Aging and previously professor of pharmacy in the Dean uh, of and then Faculty of Pharmacy and at uh, Concord Hospital Centre for Education and Research on Aging. He is a pharmacist, academic and researcher experienced in clinical pharmacology and research on the quality use of medicines. His research focuses on understanding the variability in response to medicines and how this can be managed to optimize patient care, particularly in special patient populations such as older people, the very young and the critically ill. He's interested in translating clinical pharmacology research and high quality clinical trial evidence into real world practice. His teaching and research interests focus on the quality use of medicines. Prof. Andrew is actively involved in serving on national and international committees related to medical research, human research, ethics, medi medicine safety and regulations as well as anti-doping. Andrew, it's over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sakina, for that uh, generous introduction. And also, um, I'd like to pass on my best wishes to colleagues at the University of Peridinia. And thank you very much for this invitation to speak to you this morning. Uh, it's a, a great privilege to um, spend a bit of time um, with you and talk about my own research. Uh, but also about how this might rel relate to improved patient care, which is the theme I know uh, of your conference today uh, at the University of Peridinia. <clears throat> so just by way of background, <clears throat> to remind you that uh, I'm an academic, not a clinician, although I'll be talking about some clinical 
uh, research today. I do receive funding from a variety of sources, including uh, the Australian government uh, and also uh, some pharmaceutical companies that I also work with uh, as a consultant and a collaborator. I've also uh, been lucky enough to chair Australia's response uh, to the uh, WHO uh, medication without harm strategy. So through the Medication Safety Oversight Committee of an organization called the Australian Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare. Uh, I've been involved in a range of other committees. So that's my perspective, of course, uh, and my thoughts today um, are my own. This uh, transformative uh, global patient safety challenge reminded us about the possible harms that medicines can contribute to in patient care. And the very laudable goal of reducing these um, avoidable medication related incidents by 50% over five years is, is a very important challenge that we all as healthcare professionals have a responsibility to uh, take on. If we think about the key areas from a, a medicine's point of view, uh, then three main areas really rise to the surface in this global challenge. Uh, high risk situations, such as when people transition between care, high risk medicines uh, and polypharmacy. And these last two points uh, really overlap with my talk today. And the idea that there are some herbal medicines that may interact uh, as part of a polypharmacy mixture that do pose a high risk. And I'll discuss some of the high risk medicines that we've investigated as part of herb drug interactions today. And really the uh, focus about reducing preventable harm has taken on these three major scenarios uh, and they've translated into initiatives and research, of course, to inform uh, better practice. Uh, as a pharmacist, and I know in our audience today, we have uh, people from across the health professions. Thank you for joining us. I certainly know that we have a critical role as pharmacy in being leaders when it comes to uh, in ensuring patient safety from preventable harm related to medicines. And the International Pharmacy Federation has put out a number of great resources um, for all healthcare professionals, but particularly targeted pharmacists to help guide them through their responsibilities in reducing the burden of preventable harm from medicines. And while these medicine, uh, these uh, documents are really critical, I do think they miss a bit of a point about the role of complementary and herbal medicines uh, in this uh, situation. If we think about medication safety, we know there are five main moments, if you like, of medication safety. And I know Patricia will talk about a workforce and nursing perspective, and, and this is a language which is very common in that professional space, and I really appreciate it. It is about the different moments where we can intervene, where we need to be careful, where we need to make sure that we're making the right choice or helping people make the right choice. So if it is about the selection of a medicine, about how they might add, take that medicine, medicines that are added, and that's where I'll focus today when it comes to the potential for herb drug interactions, but also our role in reviewing those medicines and where appropriate reviewing and ceasing medicines to um, reduce the burden of harm. So these are the different uh, places where we can intervene. In Australia, we often talk about the quality use of medicines. Uh, other countries and through the WHO might talk about the rational use of medicines. And it's three simple things. What is the best management option for a person? Is it a, a prescription medicine, a herbal medicine? Is it uh, surgery? Is it physiotherapy? Uh, is it watchful waiting and good clinical care? If it is a medicine, then we choose the right medicine for the right person. Uh, and that does rely on evidence about whether that medicine works and is safe. Uh, and the last point, of course, is that we use the medicine safely and effectively. And that particularly helps us focus on the combinations of medicines that might be used together. And that's part of my uh, focus today. So those elements of does it work, uh, is it, does it work in practice, and also is it worth it, are also elements of the evidence hierarchy that we might apply to any use of any medicine, uh, including combinations of prescription medicines and herbal medicines. So maybe just a point to remember is that every medicine carries the potential for unwanted and harmful effects. And so Derek Dunlop, who was the founder, of course, of the yellow card system for pharmacovigilance in the UK, had this fantastic quote, show me a drug with no side effects and I'll show you a drug with no actions. And the, the very pharmacological properties of a molecule that allow it to be a therapeutic um, 
medicine also mean that it carries some burden of unwanted effects. And we often hear people talk about complementary and herbal medicines to say they're natural and therefore they're safe. But I actually think if we adapt Sir Derek Dunlop's quote, we can also say that show me a herb with no side effects and I'll show you a herb that probably has no effects at all. So that's something to remember when it comes to how we might look at the evidence for the use of different uh, therapeutic interventions because the quality use of medicines equally applies to herbal medicines as it would do for uh, what we might broadly call conventional medicines. So this idea of translating the WHO challenge into what we can do as healthcare professionals really comes down to a number of uh, important steps. It is about understanding the factors that are relevant to um, the uh, medication safety incidents. They are complicated and they do require a multidisciplinary, multifaceted response. That's all of us being involved. It does start with informing the person about their healthcare choices. We would call that shared decision-making or person-centered care. We do need to make sure that we reconcile all the medicines. We know about every medicine a person is taking, including herbal medicines. We should also think about when a medicine is started, how carefully we might monitor combinations of those medicines and where there is a risk that we carefully de-prescribe or reduce that medicine. So maybe just to focus a bit more on complementary medicines. And here is a map of Australia, of course, overlaid with complementary medicines uh, and herbal medicines used by Australians. And Australians, like many developed countries, love herbal medicines. Uh, and they've found uh, quite a significant market in Australia, particularly in primary care, uh, where people make a choice about the health supplements and complementary herbal medicines that they might be receiving. Uh, and we've indicated here some of the, uh, by the size of the title, some of the herbal medicines involved in herb drug interactions in a database that we have been uh, curating. Uh, and if we're, I just break it down to give you some of the names of some of these commonly used herbal medicines in Australia, this is from a population survey of people reporting what they do. I'm sure many of these herbal medicines would be familiar to you or you would have heard of or seen before. Uh, and today I'll touch on uh, just a couple, including uh, one of the herbal medicines implicated in a significant number of drug interactions called St. John's wort, Hypericum. I'm also acutely aware, and certainly in my many conversations with um, Dr. Sakina, that uh, complementary and particularly herbal and traditional medicines, Ayurvedic medicines, types of people in Sri Lanka. I'm also heartened to see uh, quite a lot of research that's been done to look at these herbal medicines, traditional medicines as uh, uh, natural products that have therapeutic benefit. We also know that from an affordability and access point of view, many people uh, living in, with uh, low income may be uh, using traditional medicines as part of their day-to-day -day care. And we certainly, I certainly come from a point of view, trained as a, as a pharmacist, that we need to respect the choices that people make. So my interest in herb drug interactions is about providing a safe framework for the, the use of medicines. This uh, particularly interesting survey of looking at the types of products that are used also highlight a number of interesting um, aspects of who uses complementary medicines, uh, herbal medicines and which ones. Uh, and shown on table two here is the uh, family of different uh, plants that are commonly used uh, by people uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, and of course, it relies on publications. And I've looked at this lens, not from Sri Lanka, but also from the literature. So you would know uh, better than myself, the types of medicines that are actively uh, used in the community and the products uh, and the manner in which they're used. I found this a very interesting observation uh, from uh, colleagues here in Sri Lanka, looking at the nature of the health conditions that people use for their um, uh, for complementary or traditional medicines. And you'll see some involve acute health problems, but many involve um, uh, chronic uh, health conditions. Also the manner in which people uh, administer or prepare and administer different traditional medicines, including uh, in salads and curries, of course, as a powder. Infusions are very common, uh, uh, obviously in hot water. Topical application as a paste, is there as well. And you can see a range of different uh, routes of administration and product types. Uh, and that's part of my message today is that interactions and even the evidence of efficacy 
and safety will vary depending on uh, the nature of the traditional medicine, herbal medicine, and even uh, how it's administered and, of course, how it's prepared prior to administration. If I uh, go a bit, a bit closer to my own experience, we know that in a country like Australia, complementary medicines are widely used and most people use these in combination or at the same time as their conventional medicines. So this does pose the potential for herb-drug interactions that are of interest, and that has sparked my particular interest. And this data comes from a national survey. It's, uh, it's a bit old, this data now, but it's certainly very relevant uh, and certainly um, more recent studies have, have confirmed uh, Australia's interest or Australians' interest in continuing to take complementary and herbal medicines. So as healthcare professionals, we're interested in that evidence and information to inform con uh, consumers about in a shared decision-making way about the choices they have and understand that risk so that we can manage medication safety. And really, this does come down to the quality of evidence and information we have. And I think it's central that we understand how a herb and a drug might interact and the mechanism that's involved here. That allows us then to predict interactions, to assess the clinical significance, is this likely to be dangerous, and also figure out how we can minimise uh, the potential harms by the dosing, dose adjustment, or perhaps even deprescribing. So if I, I jump to, I suppose, the end of part of my, my story today, it is when, does, when do herb drug interactions become clinically significant? And that really depends on a number of factors that would be well known to many healthcare professionals on the line uh, about the characteristics of the person. Does that herbal medicine inhibit the activity of a drug or does it enhance the, pro, the, the, uh, the pharmacological activity of the drug by perhaps altering its metabolism in the body? Uh, what is the nature of the pharmacodynamic response? I'll share some data with an anticoagulant warfarin. And of course, when you disrupt the uh, pharmacodynamics of warfarin, you're either putting a person at greater risk of stroke or at risk of bleeding. So you can see that that becomes very uh, serious. So that's the safety margin as well of the herbal medicine and of course, the drug of interest. Uh, we've increasingly understood that the quality and nature of the herbal medicine becomes very important. And this can vary widely. If it's a, a traditional medicine based on herbs prepared at home, that could be quite different to a pharmaceutical grade preparation of a herbal medicine uh, that reliably delivers active ingredients that are known to have uh, drug interaction properties. So that, that can be an important part of how we interpret the information. Of course, the dose and duration of therapy based on the pharmacological principle, principles of drug action is a critical part to actually determining whether or not um, a drug, herb drug interaction could be dangerous. A higher dose for a longer period, of course, will be more dangerous. The time course of that interaction, if we take the example of St. John's wort, we know that uh, a single dose is probably fine, but if you take St. John's wort for a week, it has an impact on drug metabolizing enzymes, and then the interaction is apparent. So this time course is important to appreciate as well. And sometimes there's a physical interaction between the herb, maybe it's a gum or a resin, that is, that is used, it can bind up a drug. So by separating the dose administration, we can often avoid uh, different interactions. So that comes back to appreciating the mechanism by which these occur. So if we dive into the evidence uh, that we're able to find in the literature, we can see most of the different types of uh, literature presented here. Right at the top, arguably, is the best quality information where we synthesize information from a variety of sources. We may have studies in patients or healthy volunteers. And I'm going to talk today about some of the, one of the approaches that we use to bring this information together in what's called physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling. And I'll explain that um, a bit later on. Much of the literature though, unfortunately, is uh, like case reports, observations in the clinic. And while they're very important for generating ideas and hypotheses, they're difficult to use to guide treatment because they're often limited uh, when it comes to how we can interpret the evidence. There's many uh, animal studies that are done and translating those to humans is difficult. In vitro studies uh, for herb drug interactions aren't very relevant given that many herbal medicines are multi-component ingredient complexes which are metabolized in the body. So it's difficult to translate that information. Uh, sometimes it's looking at population data by looking at adverse events. Again, this is observational in nature. 
And other times it's um, it's theoretical. Uh, things like valerian is used as a sedative. It will interact with other sedatives. And of course, that makes perfect sense, even though there might not be a systematic review that, that actually um, proves that. <clears throat> so we use each of these. And I might just use some examples of this uh, type of evidence uh, to uh, highlight how we might apply this. So if we start with the idea of controlled clinical trials in healthy volunteers. So these are commonly involving what we might call pharmacokinetic endpoints, what the body does to the drug, or pharmacodynamic endpoints, what the drug or herb does to the body. So we might measure concentrations of the drug uh, and in a concentration time profile here, we might compare the area under the curve and compare that between um, uh, the drug being used alone or in combination with the herbal medicine. We might also measure outcomes like blood pressure or clotting status, such as INR, and I'll share some data with you from our, our study on warfarin, as I said, or perhaps even other metrics like cholesterol. So these are pharmacological studies, usually conducted in healthy volunteers, and they do tell us about what mechanisms might be uh, underpinning this. So here is a series of studies that we did uh, looking at the anticoagulant warfarin. And I've shown on this graph here the ratio of the area under the curve. So this is uh, looking at the average concentrations, if you like, and how they changed in healthy male volunteers who received warfarin, uh, but also received it on an occasion where they were treated with different herbal medicines. And you can see for ginseng, ginkgo, ginger, cranberry, and garlic, we did not see any significant change in pharmacokinetics of warfarin when we administered this to healthy volunteers. But we did see a significant reduction in the concentrations for healthy volunteers who also received St. John's wort for a week, hypericum. And there was a reduction in concentration, which we know is also associated with a reduction in response. Uh, and you can see here, I'll put the limits of about a 20% change and that really sparks our interest in saying there's a potential uh, clinically meaningful interaction here we need to be wary of. We also looked at pharmacodynamics. And this particular graph, we're looking at the clotting status, the international normalized ratio of prothrombin time and how it changed between receiving warfarin alone or in combination with the herbal medicine. And you'll notice that there's a reduction in response for St. John's wort on the left, but also an increase uh, in the risk of bleeding uh, based on a higher INR when it's co-administered with cranberry juice extract, which we used in this particular study. And this was based on a case report observation we saw of a person receiving warfarin who had a fatal bleed while taking cranberry juice. And this study demonstrated that there is a pharmacodynamic, not a pharmacokinetic, but um, cranberry juice somehow impacts on the uh, pharmacodynamic response to, um, to what we're seeing for uh, this particular uh, herbal medicine. Just gonna put my clock back on so I know where I'm up to. So we can see increased risk of bleeding. So controlled uh, studies in healthy volunteers can give us good insight into the mechanism and some uh, insight into the clinical significance by, based on the size of the effect. But of course, these are not people taking warfarin with all their other comorbidities and health problems. They're healthy volunteers. Um, just as a sidebar, if you like, we a while today I'm talking about herb drug interactions. We've also conducted a study recently where we looked at uh, giving a combination of different herbal medicines and complementary medicines together. And we wanted to identify whether or not there might be a interaction between the herbal components uh, themselves. In this particular study, we wanted to give a cocktail, if you like, or a combination of different herbal medicines to investigate their impact on osteoarthritis in a clinical trial. But before we could do the trial, we needed to establish whether or not giving the combination together may somehow disrupt the concentrations of the, the key ingredients in those herbal medicines. And while it's a complicated slide, this was an interesting study because it was one of the first times we've looked at herb-herb interactions. So we're looking at the constituents and whether they interacted. And in this particular study, we found no significant pharmacokinetic interaction between the constituents, which allowed us then to do the trial and have confidence that those con constituents were getting into the bloodstream. And also uh, we could measure hopefully the pharmacological effect. And this was led by a number of my colleagues who I've uh, shown here. So maybe just to step to the highest level of evidence around systematic reviews, and there's quite a number of systematic reviews about herb-drug interactions. 
One of the biggest challenges, though, is variability in the nature of these studies. And that's nicely highlighted in one of these, one of the very early um, uh, uh, studies of this type, which was published in the British Medical Journal. It's a while ago now, but it really looked at some of the first studies around the possible uh, interaction with St. John's wort and a range of medicines. Now, shown in this particular graph, the, the medicines themselves are not labelled, and I've put zero as no interaction. So this is looking at the percent change in the area under the curve. And you can see that uh, there's quite significant variability. While there's an overall trend, if you like, to see a reduction in the systemic exposure. And we know that to be the case based on the mechanism by which uh, hyperforin, one of the ingredients works. And I'll, I'll show you more about that in a moment. But actually there's quite substantial variability between trials. There's not a consistent effect. And sometimes it's highly variable. You can see that some of those trials have very wide uh, dosing intervals. And here is our study uh, with uh, Jimmy Zhang who led our research, uh, which we published in the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology. So these systematic reviews are of interest, but of course, they sometimes are difficult to collate information based on the variable nature of the studies of themselves. And one of the challenges with herbal medicines is highlighted here. Now, we generally know that co-administration of St. John's wort with the uh, drug for cardiac arrhythmia, digoxin, which in itself has a narrow safety margin, we know uh, is a potentially serious drug interaction. This particular study done um, in Germany uh, it's a while ago now, but it really highlighted a critical aspect. You can see down on the left-hand side here the, the different manner in which St. John's wort or extracts, so ZE117 is a standardised extract of St. John's wort. Uh, you can see a T or the powder itself or the uh, LI160 standardised extract down the bottom there. Each of these uh, represent uh, all of which broadly would be called St. John's wort in products but actually the different presentations based on dose, whether it's a juice, whether it's a powder, whether it's a tea or an oil. And there's a very uh, significant variability in the size and nature of the interaction. So for example, the LI160 extract that I've highlighted with a red arrow down the bottom, we'd be quite confident that there's a significant interaction there. But if the, drug, if the herb was given as an oil or a tea, then we'd have no confidence of a potential interaction with the joxin. And obviously that makes it very difficult to uh, make a recommendation. We don't actually know anything about the clinical efficacy of these different extracts as well, although there are clinical trials with the uh, LI160 extract, and I think with the ZI117, which show that St. John's wort uh, is a moderately effective antidepressant uh, and certainly used in a number of countries. We dived a bit deeper into this study uh, with this paper that we published uh, a little while ago, looking at that question of uh, the drug that's involved, the pathway that the drug's metabolized or transported by, and particularly tried to look at the formulation and product and the dose. And really what we found was that the nature of an interaction between this herb and other medicines very much depended, uh, particularly on the formulation, the nature of the product, uh, but also the dose. Were, were, were the people seeing uh, taking enough of the dose to lead to a clinically significant interaction? Uh, and that led us further into uh, trying to uh, synthesize together more information about these different types of study. And I'd like to highlight today some of our research around uh, what we broadly call modeling and simulation. Uh, and this is where we use a physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling approach. And this work has been led by Jeffrey Adewajaja, one of my uh, former PhD students. He's now a postdoc in the US. Jeffrey's a pharmacist from Indonesia who worked with us. Uh, and Jeffrey was particularly talented uh, at understanding the concepts of pharmacokinetics, but also using computers to simulate and predict what might happen. So shown in the graphic on the left here is a representation of the human body. And you can see the different tissues are represented as well as arterial blood and venous blood. And using, uh, I suppose, a complicated series of mathematical equations, which are embedded in different platforms like um, SimSIP, which is a simulation platform, you're able to actually, uh, first of all, predict the pharmacokinetics of hyperforin, which was the key ingredient in St. John's wort, which leads to the risk of interaction. You then use the, the equation, which is shown there in, uh, on the left-hand side under, the, under B, which has the uh, 
enzyme induction. So it increases the amount of enzyme there, which increases the metabolism and how that changes over time. Jeffrey then was able to apply this model to pharmacokinetics for a range of drugs. And they're presented uh, in this particular graphic uh, shown uh, just here on the right. Uh, so you can see from alprazolam through to omeprazole, different drug metabolizing pathways that are involved and that the model was able to predict the nature of the interaction. So he compared here what the model predicted, but also what was observed. And the power of this model is that it gives us very good mechanistic insights into, okay, what dose of hyperforin would lead to the threshold of an interaction? But also if we had a brand new drug that had never been studied, um, we could put it into this model and decide whether or not there's likely to be drug interactions. So this physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling approach is being increasingly used uh, to look at uh, dosing uh, for other types of drug-drug interactions, particularly as part of regulatory submissions, but also adjusting doses in vulnerable populations, such as the very old, uh, the critically unwell, who might have renal impairment or, or hepatic impairment, or the very young based on body size and the development of different enzymes. So a very powerful tool to synthesize information uh, from the literature, but a variety of sources to guide our understanding of this. And, and certainly using it in this context has provided very important insights around herb drug interactions. Um, one of the uh, complementary medicines that's widely used around the world is, of course, uh, the curcuminoids. And curcumin, the active ingredient in turmeric and the like, are widely used in many cultures, in many um, uh, culinary traditions, but also increasingly used in uh, therapeutic sense. Uh, and curcumin dosing has been widely recommended uh, for people with different inflammatory conditions, including uh, conditions such as osteoarthritis, but many others as well, and also through to different types of cancer. But I would hasten to add that the evidence for uh, treatment and prevention of cancer is very um, low. Now, interestingly, uh, we know that the combined use with an anti-cancer drug would be a significant um, potential risk. So it could be that the, uh, a herb might disrupt a cancer treatment by either making it um, less effective. Uh, so many of the treatments that we hear people take uh, to reduce the severity of side effects of cancer treatments may be reducing the efficacy of those cancer treatments, uh, or perhaps they could lead to very serious side effects as well. Uh, and Jeffrey, in his research, his photos there, also looked at this idea of um, uh, how we might understand more about uh, curcumin interactions. And one of the very interesting challenges with curcumin is it has a very high metabolism in the body. It is, uh, has a high first pass effect. So it means that even though you might ingest quite a lot of it, the amount that makes it in the bloodstream is relatively low, uh, not only because it's metabolized, but also because the herb itself uh, is very poorly soluble. So there's been a range of formulations that have been tested to try and enhance the concentrations in the body of curcumin. So many of the clinical trials that have been done around herb drug interactions showed no interaction, but probably because curcumin could not get into the body. So Jeffrey did a series of studies which are presented in this particular paper, which uh, I won't go into too much detail on, but it focused around uh, two of the anti-cancer drugs, imatinib and uh, bacitinib. Uh, Jeffrey conducted a series of studies in vitro and showed that actually Curcumin and its metabolite, curcumin glucuronide, are very good at inhibiting drug metabolism in isolated hepatocytes in liver cells. So he wanted to ask the question, how does that translate to what happens in people? Does that mean that people should not take curcumin uh, uh, in combination with, say, imatinib for the treatment of uh, chronic myeloid leukemia, for example? And using the same approach I described to you before with a physiologically based pharmacokinetic model, it was able to con uh, predict the concentrations of curcumin and its metabolite within the cells of the body uh, and to look at the concentrations of imatinib and how it is metabolized. And I've just shown you the imatinib dose here. So the, the recommended dose for imatinib uh, is really, uh, it's relatively low. And you'll see that uh, if we look at the, the typical dosing of imatinib and the typical dosing of um, curcumin on the left-hand side there under uh, the heading A, there's no significant action uh, interaction between curcumin uh, and imatinib. So in vitro, it predicts a very significant interaction. But what we predict in people 
uh, is that there'd be no interaction. And that clinical trial has not been done as yet. And part of that is that curcumin does not achieve adequate concentrations at the site of metabolism to disrupt uh, the metabolism of imatinib itself. There's also a few aspects around how uh, imatinib is handled in the body. It uh, inhibits uh, its own metabolism, which has its own complications. But it showed that you'd have to take uh, a dose of uh, about six grams twice a day of curcumin, which is way beyond the recommended dosing of curcumin before you saw a significant interaction. So um, this model was also tailored towards uh, a particular product or type of uh, curcumin. So this reminds us that the herb drug interaction significance very much depends on the product, uh, obviously the herbal medicine and the dose that's being administered. So maybe just to summarize a little bit about what we know and what we've, I've tried to talk to you about today when it comes to herb drug interactions. Uh, and I've mentioned the importance of understanding how interactions occur, the mechanism, and also the importance of clinical significance. So if we only look at experiments in isolated cells and microsomes, then actually we get a lot of information about mechanism. We can go down to the exact enzyme and perhaps even the concentration that's needed. Uh, but of course, from a mechanistic point of view, we lose information uh, once we start to give that to patients, for example. But we gain information when it comes to the clinical relevance uh, of that information. Of course, the most relevant study is when we give it to people who are receiving that treatment as part of their care and we observe uh, whether or not it alters their therapy, whether the medicine's still effective, that there's a pharmacokinetic interaction or possible harmful interactions. So we're, we're trading off all the time. Uh, the mechanism, and of course, the clinical relevance. And hopefully what I've showed to you today with those two examples is that by using the, the physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling, we can start to combine information between isolated cells to predict what we might see in patients. And we can affirm that with uh, studies in healthy volunteers. So we're really uh, gaining some greater insights now around this. So one last thing to just point to make before I wrap up and take your questions is really about how we read the literature uh, when it comes to uh, studies about herbal medicine. So that could be related to efficacy, safety, or herb drug interactions. And this consort statement uh, provides us with a very good framework for understanding the types of checklists that we're after when it comes to getting that critical information to guide the quality use of herbal medicines uh, which is part of, as we discussed at the start, uh, the, the WHO patient, uh, Global Patient Safety Challenge of achieving the optimal and safe use of medicines. And one of the key factors they highlight here in that long checklist, which I didn't put the, you through to go through in detail, is the nature of the product itself. When it comes to a conventional medicine, we have some confidence that if it says it contains, you know, 100 milligrams of aspirin, that in that product is 100 milligrams of aspirin and that is being reliably delivered. But of course, herbal medicines are complex products. They actually uh, have a range of uh, characteristics depending on the type of plant, the type of presentation or formulation, the manner in which it's prepared, the dose in which it's ingested. Uh, and sometimes in clinical trial evidence about herbal medicine, this is missing. So if you find yourself evaluating herbal interventions, it's really good to go back to this checklist and ask people about the nature of the, the herbal medicine itself and what they know about the quality of that herbal medicine product uh, and how it's been prepared, because that will allow us to make some, uh, gain some insights into how we might predict it. So just to wrap up uh, some of those key points, um, we do know that selected herbal medicines have the potential for clinically significant interactions. Uh, and we discussed those things that do make it clinically significant, the characteristics of the patient of course, is a critical one there as well. And when we're investigating herb, herb drug interactions and, and synthesizing information about it, it's important to know how that interaction occurs, the mechanism. We also know that the evidence may be uh, herbal product specific because of the quality of that product. We need to understand and remember the hierarchy of evidence uh, that is there and also the quality of the information that's presented based on all of the reporting that's presented there as well. Uh, and I might just remind you to put this talk back into the context of the uh, global patient uh, safety challenge, of course, medication without harm, remembering that actually, if it is about respecting a person's choice, it's about shared decision-making, 
explaining to them about the risks of potential herb drug interactions, how they can be avoided, making sure that when we ask people about the medicines they're taking during medication reconciliation, that we also ask about different traditional or herbal medicines. Uh, and that when those combinations are taken, we, we do carefully monitor those medicines. And if there is a concern, work with the patient to reduce the exposure to one of those medicines, uh, particularly herbal medicine by de-prescribing. So perhaps with that, I'll finish my presentation and uh, might just stop my slides from sharing and I'll uh, take any questions. Thank you very much. So um, I, I can see um, one of the questions there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor McLaughlin, for sharing your research. I appreciate that. Uh, could I talk a little bit about the uh, registration requirements for market in herbal medicines in Australia uh, compared to pharmaceuticals? So actually the regulation of uh, herbal medicines and complementary medicines in Australia uh, is a little bit controversial. So Australia, like many countries around the world, has a risk-based regulatory system. So if we have a high risk medicine, then it has a higher level of regulation and higher level of evidence is needed around the safety, quality and efficacy of that medicine. Uh, and actually, I, I've been involved in a series of publications where we did actually look at um, this and, and a bit later I'll pop that in the chat, you can have a look at it. But in Australia, we have a system of, uh, if medicines are very low risk, uh, like many herbal medicines are, then we would uh, generally have a, a light touch, they call it light touch re registration, uh, where uh, information must be held by the sponsor uh, and provided if required by the TGA, and there's clear evidence of product quality, but they don't need to provide a detailed package of uh, safety and efficacy information. Uh, the TGA, the Australian regulatory body, also publishes a, a list of agreed indications. So reasons why people might be using complementary medicines and claims that can be supported with those medicines. So uh, what's often missing though, is the potential for how those medicines might, the risk of those medicines might change when they're co-administered with other medicines. So it does remain, um, the medicines themselves might be relatively safe uh, when used alone in health, otherwise healthy people, but actually the combination is often overlooked. So I think many countries struggle with how best to regulate complementary and herbal medicines. Are they foods? Are they nutritional supplements? Or are they medicines? And I must say, I have advocated for the view that, you know, they are medicines. Let's treat them like that. Let's try and generate the evidence and information to guide um, the safe and effective use of those medicines. Thank you for your question. Sakina, I might hand back to you, or if you had any questions, I'm happy to respond to them. Have a, a good question there as well, it just came up. Um, what would you think about the role of pharmacists to disseminate knowledge to the community? Um, uh, so in Asian country like Sri Lanka, widely used um, herbal medicine. So um, I think this is a great question as uh, I think all healthcare professionals have a responsibility to understand um, about all the medicines that a person is taking as part of their healthcare in the same way that a healthcare professional would take a, med a medical history about their health journey and other interventions they've had. It's really important we capture um, uh, we capture the information about um, uh, other other medicines. So first of all, I'd say that if a person uh, is taking a herbal and complementary medicine, it's good to understand uh, what they hope that medicine will provide for them. So understanding why they're taking it and making sure that we can provide them with information that helps them make a, an informed choice about the safety of that medicine, about the right dose, if there is evidence there, and whether or not um, it's likely to be effective. And if they are using a, a traditional or um, herbal medicine for treatment of a serious health condition, you know, that we make it uh, very clear that there are, um, you know, alternative 
perhaps conventional alternatives, uh, provide them with a pathway to care to access those other medicines. Um, I think it does start from a position of respecting their choice uh, and not uh, disregarding traditional medicines. As you would well, you well know, these medicines have been used for generations and handed down often uh, through different families. And some may argue it's a placebo effect, which provides some sort of uh, treatment and what's the harm. But of course, if they have a serious health condition that has you know, uh, long-term uh, and potentially very serious consequences, then it's not adequately treated. I do think we have a duty of care across all the health professions to make it very clear about you know, what is the best treatment option for a person while supporting uh, and helping them understand their own interests. Um, a complex part of this, though, is a person's own health beliefs and their health literacy. So what they know about the determinants of health and also about how medicines may or may not help them. Of course, pharmacists, as the medicines experts, are uh, uniquely positioned to be able to provide some insight into this. And I think um, you know, that's an important point uh, in that regard. So thank you for your question. So in short, I think pharmacists have a really good role. Uh, I think we also need to find the best resources to look up information uh, about that. So, Thanks very much, Professor Andrew, for your nice presentation. No and it's much relevant to Sri Lanka and a lot of new information for our audience. And I'm sure they gain um, information on drug herb interactions. So you showed in your presentation, there are many uh, evidence that Sri Lankans use uh, herbs for, to get cure uh, for many illnesses. And also we have the practice of using um, Ayurvedic uh, medicines uh, in combination with the allopathic medicine. But we do not have, I mean, uh, any, any data to show drug herb interaction. So I'm sure you are... Uh, um, findings will help us to do more research and to come up uh, with, uh, uh, to find out what is happening in Sri Lanka, in Sri Lankan setting. So thank you, Andrew. Is there, uh, since awesome. there is no uh, more questions, uh, we'll uh, conclude session one. Thank you very much for your you. time and effort to share your thoughts and um, research findings with us. Now we are moving to session two. Session two is presented by Professor Patricia Davidson. Professor Patricia Davidson joined the University of Wollongong as a vice chancellor in May 2021. Prior to her current role, Professor Davidson was dean of the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing in Baltimore in United States. In 2021, she was the recipient of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. Distinguished Leader Award. This honor uh, celebrates her exceptional contribution to the advancement of global health worldwide. As a leader in nursing, healthcare, and advocacy, Professor Davidson's work focuses on person centered care delivery and the improvement uh, of cardiovascular health outcomes for women and vulnerable populations. She has extensively studied chronic conditions, transitional care, palliative care, and the translation of innovative, acceptable, and sustainable health initiatives across the world. Professor Davidson also serves as Council General of the International Council on Women's Health Issues and was a past board member of CUGH and Secretary General of the Secretariat of World Health Organization, collaborating centers for nursing and midwifery. She also serves on the board of health, healthcare services for the National Academics of Sciences, Engineering and Medicines in the United States. Professor Patricia Davidson, it's over to you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Sakina, and um, to my colleagues at Peridania for the kind information. And um, thanks to Andrew, who really emphasised the importance of the quality use of medicines. I'm going to sort of maybe switch gears a little bit and really focus on thinking about the healthcare workforce as a way of making sure that we do have safe and effective use of medicines. I'd also wanted to just acknowledge um, 
the death and devastation around the world at the moment. And I know in um, Sri Lanka, there have been 5,000 deaths at least from COVID-19. And for many of you who are listening into this webinar, I know are at the forefront of this pandemic and I thank you for all of the work that you're doing. So what I want to do today is sort of build on um, some of the comments that Andrew made in the of the challenges in the quality use of medicines. Discuss the healthcare workforce globally and the need to really address this from a um, global perspective. Talk about how we're going to achieve the sustainable development goals and how medication safety and workforce are integrally related to these factors. And I hope at the end of this presentation that you, we all will recognise the need to build the global healthcare workforce and also how we get adequate representation of specialist workers within the population, including pharmacists. So as Andrew mentioned, we know that misadventure from medications is very common. And um, the other thing that is really important to remember that, um, that over 134 million adverse events actually occur in low and middle income countries. And the cost of medication misadventure is you know, up to $2 trillion annually. And I think it's important to recognize that just not is there um, the risk of adverse drug events, but there is significant lack of access to medicines, testing and vaccines and COVID-19 has clearly um, underscored these disparities. And as Andrew mentioned, the causes and nature of adverse drug events are often complex and multifactorial. And it's important that we consider medication misadventure or medication adverse drug re reactions within a framework of patient safety, which is a process of activities that create cultures, processes, procedures, behaviors, technologies and environments in healthcare that consistently and sustainably lower risks and avoid harm. So as a consequence, we all know that workforce is integral to healthcare. And so as well, as much as thinking about medications in terms of drug interactions and issues in medication management, we also have to think about the environment in which we work. I really commend to you this uh, document on the global strategy, which is a, looks at a human resources for health environment. And then also the importance of the sustainable development goals that each and every one of you know are so important. Often because of the silos in which we work in healthcare, we often think about health as sustainable goal number three is where we operate. But as we've seen today with the release of the climate report from, from the United Nations that the health and well-being of our planet is determined by many, many factors. And also when we look at the sustainable development goals, aspects particularly of gender inequality in healthcare are really important in terms of advancing patient outcomes. So when we look at the sustainable development goals, we want to think about not just health and not just medications as drugs we give to people, but how we interface and work together within a complex ecosystem. So the WHO Human Resources for Health has really, as you can see, mapped across the sustainable development goals. And so the healthcare workforce is, for example, related to in goal 10, which looks at migration of healthcare workers. In goal five, which looks at gender equality. And also if we look at um, goal eight, you know, the healthcare workforce is one of the greatest employers in many countries and sectors. And it, as a consequence, contributes significantly to economic stability. So thinking about workforce, external to um, a broader socio-ecological framework is, is very challenging. 
And also what we know, particularly as we look at health disparities, that um, aspects such as poverty and hunger and access to healthcare and quality education, that is social determinants of health, the situations in which people are born and live and die are very important. The other factor that is really important for each of us to address is universal healthcare, which is one of the key strategies of the World Health Organization. And as you can see here in this cartoon, is that really the quality of human resources for health is dependent upon the availability and capability of a competent, confident and credentialed workforce. It's not just sufficient to have access to healthcare, but as was identified by Andrew in his presentation, and what we need to do has to be acceptable to patient populations and the settings in which we work. And also we recognize that the global patient safety challenge that Andrew mentioned is complex and multifaceted and spans beyond just drug regulations. Um, I think an important thing to consider, particularly in low and in middle income countries, is the impact of substandard and falsified medical pro products. You'll be well aware of, I think maybe five years ago, you know, the death of about 200 people in India because contamination of their antihypertensive medications. But what is really important to realize that in particular, as many um, uh, countries increase regulation, there is also a ten tendency for bad actors to engage in um, substandard manufacturing processes and falsifying products. And each of these factors contributes not just to in a, a lack of efficacy of medications targeting particular conditions, but also uh, has led to the progression of antimicrobial resistance and high disease prevalence. So I think it's very important to, to think about um, the impact. And I commend to you this book by one of my colleagues from Boston College, Mohammed Zaman, who really discusses this complex interplay of the social, political and economic factors that impact just not access to medications and vaccines as we're seeing now during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the need for controls and governance and to celebrate initiatives such we, as we have in Australia and Andrew spoke about, but provide us with a framework for quality use of medicines and governance and monitoring of medication administration and also drug development and approval. Now, the social determinants of health, as I mentioned previously, are critical to think about within a, not just the workforce, but in terms of access to medications. It is clearly those who are more vulnerable, who are more at prey to um, medication that is bought on the black market, or I've seen in some of instances where people are going to animal to veterinary providers to get access to antibiotics because of their failure to access um, safe healthcare services. So within a global agenda, within the context of sustainable development goals and the mandate of the World Health Organization, we have to think in a broader perspective in how we provide safe and effective services to people around the world. So, I've given you some of the challenges um, that are here. And, and I want to just maybe provide a bit of a pathway forward and then maybe talk about how we need to think about a robust workforce globally. I think, as Andrew's mentioned, we need to monitor the development and quality use of medicines. And not this is just not just for pre-market approval, but post-market surveillance and also looking at drug interactions and how people take medications. We need robust reporting mechanisms and we need to have accurate information to provide 
information, particularly in phase four clinical trials, which are in the real world where clinicians are able to anticipate adverse drug reactions, dose appropriately, and make sure that as much as possible, medication treatment is able to be tailored and targeted to specific populations. But perhaps what is more important, and it's been uh, alluded to, is that we need to empower individuals as consumers. We have to bring to people's attention, not just governments, many of the risks in medication usage and make sure that people know where they can go to get reliable information. So it, the role of the pharmacist, particularly with the increasing complexity of medication management is critically important. And that's important to think about in workforce development. Now, we do have a real labour market shortage of healthcare workers. It's estimated that by 2030, the global demand for healthcare workers will rise considerably. The supply of healthcare workers will um, not meet this demand. And we know that even though there is a high demand in upper and middle income countries, which is largely driven by the population aging and high demand, we know that middle income countries will face similar workforce shortages and some low, middle, low um, income countries will have really more of a, a, a low growth, maybe in demand and supply. But these factors are really influenced by the push and pull factors of a global economy. For some reason, my slides don't want to uh, progress. Sorry about this. Um, has that come on again? Uh, just going to. Sorry, my slides just weren't advancing. So I, I think it's important, particularly within leading organisations such as the University of Peridania in Sri Lanka, that we think about health workforce planning, in particular related to um, movement and labour market dynamics, the impact of migration and movement internationally, and I know Sri Lanka is one of the countries where there is a lot of exodus and potentially brain drain of many qualified healthcare providers. So we need to have a much greater discussion between the education sector and labour market dynamics and in particular economists. And it's really only been in, since COVID-19 that there's been a much more integrated conversation on the importance of thinking about a coordinated healthcare workforce strategy. So as a consequence of the devastation that has really occurred during COVID-19, is this year that the World Health Organization has determined 2021 to be the year of the healthcare worker. And COVID-19 for all of its trauma and devastating impact on individuals, families, and communities has put the role of um, healthcare professionals front and center. And sadly, we know that many healthcare professionals have lost their lives. I think in the United States, the richest country in the world, there's almost 4,000 healthcare professionals that have lost their lives. And similarly, we know particularly um, the, how um, COVID-19 is ravaging Indonesia, I actually heard that there's been a loss of 600 physicians. So in countries that have a low ratio of healthcare workers to population, I think with COVID-19, we really have to stop and recalibrate much of our workforce demand. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about nursing. Um, particularly within a global health agenda. Why it is important to think about, to talk about nursing is that nurses um, represent over 50% of the healthcare workforce. And in some countries, particularly where there is limited access, they're 80% of the healthcare workforce. 
And I just wanted to commend this report to you. It's called The Future of Nursing 2020-2030, which is really trying to recalibrate many of the hard lessons that we've learned during COVID-19, and particularly in terms of health disparities and health inequities. Even as, you know, Andrew and I are sitting in lockdown in Sydney for seven weeks, where the pandemic is really hitting Sydney hardest is in areas where there is less socioeconomic prosperity, where there's more multi-generational households, where people are essential workers, that is, can't sit in their bedrooms like I am working from home. So I think around the world, when we think about the healthcare workforce, we also have to think with, of that within an equity agenda. So in 2020, which was to be, well, which was the year of the nurse and the midwife, the, state, the World Health Organization um, developed a state of the world's nursing report. And this is a really critical document to advance healthcare globally and to really try and motivate and stimulate member states to invest in education, jobs and leadership, particularly of nursing. I've done a screenshot of Sri Lanka's um, uh, report. And as you can see, there's a you know, partial country capacity, but this sort of information provides really valuable information for health workforce planning. Um, it's what is, as you can see here, similarly to other populations, um, nurses are over half of the healthcare workforce. But also you can see here that they're in that pharmacists are only 2.5% of the healthcare workforce. So these sort of data are really important in helping strategize and develop an integrated workforce that is fit for purpose and appropriate to country needs. The, well, another thing that was interesting um, looking at uh, these data was that in in Sri Lanka, only 5% are um, uh, men in nursing. So even though commonly the gender equality conversation relates to the participation of um, women in the workforce, there's probably some work to be done in Sri Lanka in um, engaging men in the nursing profession. And also, as you can see here, you can start to uh, look at uh, where your workforce is, you know, in 62% uh, is in the 35 to 54% age group. So thinking about workforce planning within um, a density framework and a representation is really important um, to, to moving forward. And it's estimated that at least for nursing, that um, by 2030, that Sri Lanka is going to need another five to 6,000 nurses. But as you can see, with low numbers of um, dentists, pharmacists, and likely other allied health professionals, there's more work to be done in, in increasing um, the level of expertise available. My apologies for the, this, for some reason, my screen is playing. So just um, to kind of start to summarise, it's really important that we think of healthcare workforce and healthcare delivery, not just at the individual level, which we're, we're used to thinking about, you know, in my profession, in my hospital, in my community, but thinking of it within a broader organisational context, such as how healthcare deliver, is delivered within a, a country, but also thinking about it within a social, political and economic context. And so just over these next few slides, I'm hopefully going to leave you with the need to think about more investment in the healthcare workforce, but to make sure that we also need to think about it within the broader uh, social, political and economic context in which we work. And so this is largely an economic conversation, just as it is a conversation for universities in terms of healthcare planning and working. Um, and again, this is just another model um, which, which can really get people to think about 
what is the situational analysis within countries, and also what are the factors that are going to improve healthcare access, particularly looking at equity, effectiveness, efficiency, and quality. And this workforce analysis needs to be done at a country level and within a socio-cultural context. I'm now also going to um, talk to you a little bit about workforce planning and in essentially why we need to have political conversations and why the policy agenda is so critically important. So I learned pretty early in my career that one letter to a member of parliament was more powerful than a New England Journal of Medicine publication. We've just seen in COVID-19 how people have ignored data, have ignored science to move things forward. And I just wanted to, to give an example from nursing where people have consistently failed to acknowledge evidence. So this is, um, there is a group um, from the University of Pennsylvania in the United States, Linda Aiken, who's run, who's done multiple studies looking at the role of nurses. Basically, her studies have shown that where nurses have a minimum of baccalaureate education, that patients have better outcomes. And also that nurse patient ratios are related to patient outcomes. This is a study that was recently reported in The Lancet, which was undertaken in Queensland, Queensland and Australia. And no surprise is that more, that better, more effective nurse to patient ratios had um, an impact on patient mortality, readmissions and lengths of stay. And even though medication errors have not yet been subject to the same level related to, to nursing staffing, it's likely that there's similar issues. I had the opportunity to uh, write a commentary uh, with one of my colleagues, Dr. Ullman, to this, this um, paper. And what it basically tells us is that failure to really recognise the importance of workforce, the, the propensity to look at labour as a cost, not a value, and not just nurses, but physicians, pharmacists, occupational therapists and other people has led to the fact that often in spite of evidence and that is presented, that people fail to make meaningful changes to workforce to improve patient outcomes. And of course, all of that was before COVID. And COVID has set, put a spanner in the works, has set, you know, there's many phrases to use, has set seismic shifts, laid cracks wide open and bare. So it's a really critical time now to think about healthcare workforce. It's a really critical time to evaluate healthcare within an equity agenda, who is getting vaccines, who's not getting vaccines, and um, equally who is having access to treatment with COVID. So just last week, um, the World Health, Health Organization had uh, has put out a uh, framework and which outlines a global patient safety action plan with strategic ob objectives that are outlined there. So, and so what is going to make our healthcare systems better? How are we going to avoid harm? How are we going to avoid medication errors? So basically we need high reliability organizations and systems. We need to have safety of clinical processes. We need patient and family engagement. We need health worker education skills and safety. And I would argue having healthcare workers at as adequate level and also adequate distribution of skills, particularly physicians, nurses, and other allied health professionals. We need to have good information, good research to, um, upon which to base our decisions and good risk management frameworks. And also we need synergies, partnerships and solidarity if we're going to move forward the patient safety agenda. So this is going to mean not just us who are committed working in hospitals and clinics and universities to move things forward, but also a great commitment from agencies from the World Health Organization, but also public and private partnerships. 
So as I've just outlined here, we really need to have a vision in which everybody is safe, where no one is harmed in healthcare, and every patient receives safe and respectful healthcare every time, every place. But this is not going to be achieved unless we have this platform, this baseline of the aspects that I mentioned earlier. So again, just to sort of bring us back to healthcare workforce as a distribution factor, not just an absolute numbers. So as you know, and as you can see here, this is a geographical distribution of lower middle income countries showing where 84% of the world's population lives. And sadly, often there's not adequate healthcare services to be provided. So when I was preparing this talk, I came across this slide, which is a very futuristic view of what healthcare would look like, where we can, um, this is, they said, a nurse's station of the future. But sadly, in many of the settings in which we work, this is so far from reality, so far from the truth. And increasingly, particularly within a global health context, there is an increasing divide between the rich and poor, and that's within all countries. And so as well as developing a robust workforce agenda to achieve medication safety, I really think that we need to have health equity on our agenda. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to taking questions. And my apologies for my slides. Thanks, Professor Patricia, for your nice presentation. The presentation highlighted the crucial role of achieving the health targets uh, in according to sustainable development goals of WHO. With your, um, now we move on to question and answer session. So we'll see if there's any question for Professor Patricia from the audience. Yeah, uh, yes, well, there's one question from uh, yeah, Andrew. Andrew. So, you know, Andrew, I, that is just um, the, the best question. And I think the famous line is if people don't work together, if don't learn together, they can't work together. When I was at Johns Hopkins, we, one of our, the medical students, the nursing students, the pharmacy students and the public health students had sort of four sessions across the year. So, I think it's just really important to get respect for individuals' professional groups and also understands you really get to learn the importance of a team. So I think interprofessional education is a really important agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so. Session three is presented by Dr. Muhammad Fahim Abdul. Kader. Dr. Fahim is a senior lecturer in pharmacology and toxicology with research interest in etiology and biomarkers of acute and chronic kidney injury following nef nephrotoxicity and clinical pharmacy and pharmacy education. Dr. Fahim has completed his PhD related to biomarkers of acute nephrotoxicity. He is currently a research fellow at the University of Sydney, University of uh, New South Wales, and also a member board of directors of South Asian Clinical Toxicology Research Collaboration. He is serving as a member of the Medicines Evaluation Committee and Clinical Trials Evaluation Committee of the National Medicines Regulatory Authority of Sri Lanka. Also serving as a task force member of the Working Group on Human Resources, formulating the National Medicine Policy in Sri Lanka and a strategic implementation plan in collaboration with WHO. Dr. Fahim also collaborated with University of Oxford as a part of Oxford Columbia Research Collaboration. Uh, he's a member of the governance team at uh, South Asian Clinical Toxicology Research uh, Collaboration, which is SECTREC. He's a key uh, collaborator for research projects conducted by SECTREC and University of Sydney on a variety of projects. Dr. Fahim, the session is over to you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, and also it is a privilege for me to talk 
to, uh, in this webinar, along with uh, uh, two international experts um, on, and they have highlighted very important about um, quality use of medicines and how we promote that in, in the healthcare setting. So in my talk, I would like to highlight some of the evidence that was generated from Sri Lanka, uh, where we uh, use, uh, we can promote the optimal use of medicine um, by implementing the clinical pharmacy services. As Prof. Andrew and Prof. Patricia highlighted, medication-related harms are one of the leading uh, cause of, uh, I would say, it's a preventable medication harm because most of these are under the control of healthcare workforce. So if you look at the recent systematic review, which was published uh, and um, uh, of 80, 81 studies uh, involving uh, almost three, 300,000 patients, and they found a staggering number of uh, preventable medication harm, which is one in every 30 patients had a, had a possible exposure to medication harm with a pool prevalence of 3%. And all of those uh, medication-related harms, are uh, more than a quarter of them are life-threatening, So, which, which give a red alarm to us and how important of uh, preventing these errors uh, so one of the key integral of this is to work uh, together as part of the healthcare team um, and, uh, and to in, uh, promote the quality use of medicine. Having said that uh, uh, medication errors is one of the contributing factor, factor for number of uh, morbidities, it also uh, has a high, high bur burden on uh, healthcare expenditure. So, as uh, Professor Patricia highlighted, trillions of dollars have uh, been taken up by the healthcare expenditure related to um, uh, medication-related harm. It's, it it accounts for almost 1% uh, of global health expenditure. Now, uh, so having the understood that medication harm is one of the important problems to consider, uh, WHO has formulated this uh, the five-year plan starting from 2017, uh, medication uh, without harm, where uh, by 2022 or 2023 early, uh, the deaths or, uh, or reduce the harm from medicines uh, by 50%. <laughs> so where they have highlighted three key, key areas uh, of, of focus, especially medication safety in high-risk situations, including very high-risk uh, narrow therapeutic index drugs uh, as well. And then importantly, polypharmacy and transition of care. This is where my talk will be mostly focusing on polypharmacy and transition care, where we have generated some evidence from Sri Lanka, our research group have generated it, um, uh, where we have highlighted important part of one uh, research, uh, one healthcare team <coughs> member. So if you look at a typical drug chart, if you most of you might be familiar with it. So this is uh, uh, from a dialysis unit uh, in, um, in Polonaro General Hospital, where one of my research students undertook a study. You can see more than 10 complex drugs are being added to a prescription and giving a, a high risk of exposure uh, to medication-related interaction or medication-related harm. So similar, there are a number of other situations where you can see people have been using more than uh, 10 drugs uh, that will expose them to a high risk of uh, getting medication-related harm if healthcare workforce does not interfere to check those uh, in a proper way. So quality use of medicine has been highly advocated by the National Medicine Drugs Policy of Sri Lanka, where uh, the two key objectives are to promote quality use of medicines uh, uh, in, in, in Sri Lankan healthcare settings. So it, it's, it's although, although it is internationally recognized and in Sri Lanka, it has been part of now NMDP policies where, uh, where all healthcare professionals need to ensure um, uh, to improve the uh, quality of some medicine, which obviously will fulfill the WHO's uh, world, uh, global safety challenge. <laughs> now, uh, so uh, my talk is mostly on um, evidence of implementing the clinical pharmacy. So uh, in Sri Lanka, which is very relatively a new baby to Sri Lanka, 
while that's been established throughout the world as an, an evolving uh, profession doing number of uh, multiple uh, roles. Now, if you look at the general broad roles of uh, a pharmacist, so they, they do a number of roles, including regulatory pharmaceutical care, community pharmacy, and working in a hospital, some of them end up in industries, academia, and, and also the trainers. So clinical pharmacy has become an integral now part of broad roles into uh, uh, the pharmacist's uh, uh, job role. So what clinical pharmacists uh, do is the next question everyone should be asking. So they will be, they have a range of skills uh, that include uh, knowledge of drug therapy. They are the drug experts uh, and also the disease. And you know, they also have to develop uh, skills in uh, laboratory and diagnostic tests and learn to interpret them. And obviously, you know, as all health professionals, it's an excellent communication skills. So along with the range of skills uh, they have, they pose, they, they, they are tasked with a number of roles that include uh, medication history taking on admissions and reconciling them uh, with the prescription while they are in the hospitals. And, uh, and importantly, the key cause, cause, scope of today's webinar is identifying pharmaceutical care related issues where you identify whether there are drug herb interactions or any any drug interaction that involves where uh, we can uh, avoid uh, any un, uh, avoidable uh, drug related issues. So they are tasked and skilled with a range of uh, uh, tasks, uh, including the ADR management and uh, to promote the optimal use of medicine. Now, why, is, why is such a role is so important as you can see, that's been demonstrated clearly in this cheese model. When, when, when you put number of barriers in terms of the functions of a clinical pharmacist, starting from admission history and to medication reconciliation and uh, prospective review of the, uh, the patients and patients' notes and ADR management and medication, if you look at number of steps, when you put those barriers, you can uh, stop um, all the medication related harm that can end up to the patient. So it is one of the important role where the, the expert, uh, drug expert play an important role to reduce the risk from medicine, where uh, medic medicine, uh, quality use of medicine is being promoted. In Sri Lankan uh, workforce, if you look at it, uh, basically 10 years ago, before 10 years ago, it is mass mostly by a diploma uh, holders um, or last, uh, 15 or odd years, now we, are, we were able to generate the local graduates uh, in pharmacy and also from allied health, other allied health professionals, where the, 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 there is a change in shift from the traditional role, role of dispensing and, and drug management to more clinical uh, or patient care oriented role, which has been highlighted in a number of publications uh, that's been published in Sri Lanka. So, so it's very important that whatever, since the, the, the field is very new to Sri Lanka, it's just a 15 years and with the, with evident, uh, the small workforce uh, with, the, with the necessary skills in clinical pharmacy has been generated. And we need to show the evidence that the clinical pharmacy has some, uh, the benefit uh, in terms of improving the quality, quality use of medicines. So not surprisingly, this is, uh, this is not the new field uh, and it has been uh, done extensively in throughout the world where, uh, where they have shown the added role of clinical pharmacists in improving quality use of medicine and preventing uh, medication uh, related harm. So, so with the aim of generating um, uh, those evidence in Sri Lanka, uh, a CASPER a collaboration of Australia and Sri Lankan pharmacy practice and education research was established. Initially, its aim was to initiate the clinical teaching here, and uh, because that was lacking, uh, especially the clinical pharmacy uh, teaching was lacking, and the teaching was started, and that was expanded, expanded to different no domain where we are now more focusing on more research evidence generation, uh, generating over the last ten years. It is an evolving collaboration, 
uh, of pharmacy research from Sri Lanka and Australia and the UK. So it includes all the Sri Lankan universities, uh, and SACTRIC has been a, as a mediator of it, and Pharmaceutical Society of Sri Lanka and uh, Commonwealth Pharmaceutical Association also partnering with uh, CASPER to improve these research initiatives. So the first research, we, uh, as part of our group, we have published an observational study where we looked at whether there are opportunities for quality improvement uh, or quality of medicine in Sri Lanka. This was published um, uh, work and uh, where an, an observational study over six months, 478 patients were, uh, were reviewed in two medical wards in uh, Colombo North Teaching Hospital. So we, we found that there were almost 2.7 uh, per patient's uh, opportunities for medication at optimization, including a total of 1,274. 1, so only small number of uh, medication related harms are being resolved. So you can see just 10% uh, just, uh, uh, approximately, um, which, which give us, an, uh, as a, which highlights that's so important of uh, adding an, a, an expert uh, or a drug expert to resolve those kind of issues. So, and then we went, embarked on a, on a clinical uh, pharmacy intervention study where uh, Tushani, one of our uh, past MPhil students, she's currently uh, doing a PhD in, in, in New Zealand. So this was a randomized uh, control trial of 800 patients in, in, the, in the medical unit uh, and also published in WHO uh, bulletin. And um, it's funded by NHMR, funded through NHMRC via SACTRI. So we looked at, and uh, through this intervention study, we have demonstrated that uh, number of uh, almost 57% uh, of the uh, drug-related problems were resolved in intervention compared, a significant number which is compared to the control group. And medication appropriateness index, uh, uh, paid per medicine discharge was also improved uh, with the intervention of clinical pharmacists. So this is this was a ward-based clinical study, and then we embarked on a, a study where the clinics have been, uh, including especially diabetic uh, clinic, where uh, um, Nilani uh, has a look at the impact of medication counseling by pharmacists in a patient with diabetes attending uh, rural and urban uh, clinics and where she has recruited 800 patients, uh, 400 each from urban and uh, rural areas where she, she, she was involved in systematic counseling of the patients who, who were on uh, anti-diabetic medications in, in the form of the, the leaflet, which, is, which was given in the local language. She has also uh, demonstrated improved medication adherence as you can see, uh, medication adherence has improved, high ad adherence uh, in the intervention group, and also increased, uh, inc uh, uh, not surprisingly, improved patients' knowledge. And as a result of medication adherence uh, uh, with the intervention of clinical pharmacies, you could also see there is an improvement in uh, management outcome, which is HPA1C, which is within the good and fair controls. <laughs> Now, uh, recently, uh, my MPhil student, Kalpani, she has uh, just completed her MPhil study and about to submit. She, uh, we looked at uh, clinical pharmacy intervention in an ESRD clinics in, in uh, two districts, Amradapur and Polanaro, uh, a district where the CKD is very common uh, and the pa patient's medication burden also very high, where, where um, Kalpani has done this clinical pharmacy intervention and she also introduced this uh, medication uh, communication form to the doctors when they are not there. So she write whatever the medication related problems on this sheet and then we get feedback from the farm, uh, from the doctors there who, who are looking after. And this study is uh, still unpublished work. So I'll be uh, presenting some of it through uh, today's webinar. <laughs> so she has demonstrated that uh, uh, with the one year follow up in the intervention arm, there's an improvement in medication uh, adherence. So, as reflected in total BMQ scores, lower the number, the better the medication adherence. And also, she has demonstrated an increase in, in um, medication 
uh, related knowledge uh, scores. So that's obviously tell us how important is uh, educating patients who are taking a medication of more than 10, uh, 10, 10 medications for patients. So, uh, uh, and she also demonstrated improvement in number of management outcomes, including hemoglobin, serum calcium level, serum phosphate, and total cholesterol level after the one year post intervention of clinical pharmacy. So, more importantly, uh, what we need to look at is uh, how the DRPs are identified and resolved. So, so on average, uh, as I highlighted earlier, around 10 drugs per patient in these groups, and we have identified almost five, five uh, DRPs per patient. So it's, it's a high number of uh, DRPs, uh, which, was, which were resolved by both patients and, and, and the prescriber uh, in the interventional group. <clears throat> and we are now embarking on, a, on a, another study on, in, in, a, in, in mostly on a cardiology managing um, acute coronary syndrome and counseling by uh, clinical pharmacy interventions. So one of my MPhil students uh, who is looking at this intervention study where um, uh, the ACS patients are being looked after. So the evidence will, uh, will come uh, soon uh, from this study as well. <clears throat> so out of our research group, there are a number of research uh, studies that are published uh, in Sri Lanka. One of my again, a good colleague, uh, Nitoshi, uh, this is in the um, elderly care units in uh, most of the uh, all nine provin uh, province uh, were selected. So 100 residents uh, with chronic MCDs. So they reviewed uh, 446 prescription. Again, they found that uh, 168 errors were noted. So um, one of the most common errors they noted was dosing errors and missing medications. So, so these errors can be obviously uh, reduced by uh, implementing uh, a specific, specialized uh, roles or in, in, empowered workforce in these settings where, as you know, that these are the vulnerable group, these days uh, where along with the medications they take and they also vulnerable to other medical uh, conditions they've been exposed to. So while we generate evidence, it is important that uh, those generate uh, evidence generated or a part of the team, uh, they, they form a part of the team. It is very important interprofessional educations and uh, acceptance of these services. So we looked at uh, a survey uh, in Sri Lanka again as part of Tushani's study, whether, whether the clinical pharmacy is being accepted by the healthcare workforce. Uh, and uh, on, only we looked at the doctors at that time. So, with, uh, and we found that there's a high acceptance rates of implementations of clinical pharmacies recommendations in resolving DRPs by the, um, by the doctors mostly. So this evidence has to be uh, explored in, in the nursing and other healthcare professionals, whether, whether uh, they accept the recommendation of, uh, of the clinical pharmacies uh, they give. So, as I mentioned, the, the evidence on clinical pharmacy uh, services uh, from Sri Lanka, they, it will continue to generate a number of research groups are working on. And there are more opportunities available to demonstrate the reproducibility of the results in a wider range of patients, uh, including um, different areas that include surgery, cancer care, and critical care. And this uh, evidence, along with the, the global evidence, uh, it's enough for, 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 for the government to go ahead with creating positions in, uh, in the hospitals in terms of implementing the clinical pharmacy that will ultimately will benefit to the uh, patients, uh, which has been demonstrated from Sri Lankan studies and also the global studies. While, uh, while such positions are being created, there is a need of a cohort of clinical staff working with the existing staff in the transitions. As part of any profession, it is important that uh, evaluation, feedback, and education and training support of existing and new staff is fundamental, which has to be expanded in collaboration with experts from the world. So just to summarize and conclude my talk. So evidence of clinical pharmacy services from Sri Lanka is, it will, is in, uh, steadily increasing and research will continue to evolve uh, in this area. More young researchers are working on it uh, and uh, to produce more, more evidence. 
and there have been these these are published in very high quality journals so that that will tell us uh, the clinical pharmacy services can can sustain um, in the future so there is also increased need to transform the evidence generated into practice so in in, in line with all uh, other healthcare staff so they have to be a part of, uh, be part of that uh, professional network and, and work together as a team to optimize the quality use of medicines. So implementation of clinical pharmacists in a multidisciplinary practice will require more, uh, more trained pharmacies, which has to be established in collaboration with uh, international partners who are uh, working with Sri Lanka, including WHO. And also uh, the universities and the, the societies need to come up with uh, local capacity building opportunities to sustain the academic and, and teaching research. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I would like to take over any questions. Thanks, Dr. Fahim, for your nice presentation. Your presentation highlighted the importance of implementing clinical pharmacy services in Sri Lankan hospitals yeah, to achieve uh, quality use of medicines. So, since I can't see um, any question, let me yeah, let me ask you a question. Do uh, do you think it is essential uh, at this time of um, that we introduce a master's program in clinical pharmacy in Sri Lanka? Yeah, I mean, um, it's a bit of yes and no sort of answer from my side. Uh, so why, what important for us is to get into the, uh, the workforce, uh, healthcare workforce, which is lacking at the moment. And um, so what we need to more focus on undergraduate uh, curriculum, where we emphasize more on clinical pharmacy and, and uh, give more opportunities and training for, for the undergraduates who will be ending up in the, as part of this uh, multidisciplinary healthcare team. So I'm sure the time to come, you know, the masters in uh, healthcare program has to be established. Um, so there's, there's always need for, for people. There are a lot of interesting uh, groups. They, are, uh, they, they need to be, uh, they, need, they need to be emphasized, especially for example, someone who is uh, working in the hospitals already with a large, vast experience with little bit back, uh, background on uh, clinical pharmacies where you know they need masters. So obviously continuous professional developments and the master's programs are essential. Uh, but while emphasizing that it is important that we create more positions uh, by producing more evidence to the at yeah. national level. So, so it, it's, 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 a, it's a balance that has to be established, I guess. I too strongly believe the strengthening pharmacy education is important. Okay, thank you for that comment. And we have a question from Professor Andrew. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Fahim. You and your colleagues have demonstrated the value of generating the evidence of impact for pharmacy services. Are hospitals uh, and health services considering creating and funding clinical pharmacy positions to support the career progression of these roles? Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you for for your question. So, so as um, yeah, at the moment, um, so currently we are a number of uh, societies and number of government agencies, including the academics, are uh, uh, where number of uh, subcommittees we are like proposing to the Ministry of Health to establish these key roles, and we we have presented number of evidence uh, in number of forums in the in the next levels. Um, so at the moment, I would say no, they, they haven't created any, any fundings uh, for these positions. And we are obviously working uh, toward that. And I'm sure time to come, uh, the government will re realize the importance of establishing uh, clinical pharmacy service roles, especially in major hospital, at least uh, to start with. And um, so what we have done is generated this uh, evidence. So to just Otherwise, uh, someone will uh, probably ask this probably have generated evidence from elsewhere, not in Sri Lanka. So, so given that we have evidence from our own context and, um, and more evidence to come and, and government uh, will have to 
uh, will be in in a position to provide the funding i'm sure you know they will look into uh, that in the future thanks for him yes that's true evidence based studies are very important to implement pharmacies uh, clinical pharmacy services yes there's another uh, comment from andrew great leadership advocacy thank you for andrew impact. thank you thank you dr fahim for your um, presentation so now i think we are moving to the uh, final uh, session a final um, moment of this webinar thank you very much for all three speakers i'm sure audience enjoyed the talks by uh, presented by three eminent speakers a big thanks to ipers for organizing this webinar thanks to all those who helped this webinar a success so with this thanking note i would like to conclude this session thank you and have a good day